good then. We gotta do like four hours a year or something like that. Yeah. I went to the first one for the Yeah, that one doesn't work. That was the Hagabia Commission 101. <laughs> You guys have to fill out those yeah, forms like me, right? You have to have them by July 1st. Uh, well, it may be different for you. Maybe, I don't know. Good. I'll be there. 11 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? And then you go out and go out. I know, it's really know. weird, but all week it's going to be rainy and cloudy. Let's figure Oh, okay. The streets. Yeah. It's on a Wednesday night. Oh, okay. Yeah, see, Wednesday's a really bad day. Hey. I see back down there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know what happened to him. We were having the wall come down, so I figured since he wasn't here, I traded him. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, we knew that as a whole plan way back. We were going to do it six years ago. Mom, <laughs> Four got... Got These are still the ones. Yeah. 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 They haven't. They haven't got. They're going to be yeah. like. We have the whole plan like six or seven years. Because there were some things that were wrong with it. Right there. Okay. okay. Let me. Oh, I'm going to be smart. I'm afraid Twitter closed and you were in Twitter. That's what it was. He wanted to get far away from you. <laughs> At a range. Okay. Hey, it's getting close. Yeah. Well, ice for this. Here's Don't listen to him, Mark. Don't listen to him, Mark. <laughs> Don't get you in trouble. Yeah. Nice event. Yeah. I know. This is the finale. Right. That's, um, that's, you know, we do it every year. I didn't make it either this time. I try to make it always, but yeah. something was happening. I'm calling to order the regular station meeting of the Board of Commissions of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, June 6, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Alahuzas. Here. Vice Mayor Banther is absent and excused. Commissioner Sieber. Here. Commissioner Kikta. Here. Commissioner Carr. Here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our commission meeting. Tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Horn from the uh, church in the bayou, following by the presentation of the flag by uh, the police department honor guard. And if you please stand and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. If I had come two weeks ago, we might have prayed for rain, but we don't need to do that now. <laughs> Let us pray. God of all creation, I give you thanks for these servants of our community. Guide them in using all the resources available to them wisely and well. Help this commission to represent all members of our community fairly and to make decisions that promote the common good. Bless these, your servants, in this meeting and in all they do to serve this community. Amen. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Thank you. Please be seated. I'd like to uh, thank our uh, honor guard for presenting the flag and the colors today. We made these ceremonies so meaningful. Thank you. So proud of it. <coughs> We are now going to the public comments of the items that will not be discussed tonight. If you have any comments, please come forward to the podium. We're here now. We go to uh, proclamation item number one, the Hurricane Awareness Month. City of Tarapo Springs, Florida, proclamation. Whereas in August and September 2004, Hurricane Charlie Francis Jean and Ivan made landfill, landfall along the uh, Florida coast all within 44 time spent causing tremendous damage. And whereas, even though that it has been nearly 95 years since the last major hurricane made landfall in Pinellas County, and despite decreased tropical storm impacts to Florida over the past decade, Pinellas County remains extremely vulnerable to storms high winds and flooding associated with the tropical storms and hurricanes. And whereas Pinellas County and the entire Tampa Bay region faces challenges of hurricane evacuation, responses and recovery in the coast metropolitan region. And whereas residents of Tarpa Springs should be informed and empowered to take steps to keep their families, businesses, communities safe and more resilient. And whereas the key to the success is any of any hurricane evacuation plan is to inform the citizens. And now, therefore, I, Chris Alahuzis, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Tarpa Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim June 2017 as a hurricane and wireless month. Thank you. You want to say a few words? The next presentation, okay. The item number two on the agenda is a presentation. Hurricane season 2017 will be given by the fire department. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Hello, folks. Welcome to hurricane season 2017. I am Rick Butcher, fire chief, also the director of emergency management for the city of Tarpon. The reason that we're wearing shirts this year are that are not the fire department uniform shirt is because we're trying to change the culture just a little bit from hurricanes and preparedness being a first responder item. It's no longer just a police and fire issue where we go out and we ask people to, to evacuate and, and prepare yourself and all that. Hurricane preparedness involves all of us. It's an emergency management is issue. So therefore we represent emergency management, not just the fire department. We were actually able to participate in a countywide training earlier this month or last month for the integrated emergency management system with the Pinellas County. This training was a four-day training session. Chief Young and Lieutenant Drake were involved in it from the very beginning. So they're going to come up and they're going to talk more about hurricane season specific to this year. But I just want to let everybody know that we're broadening emergency management beyond police and fire. It's not just a first responder issue. The training we did involved all the department heads, our policy makers. This is, it's, it's bigger than just people in uniforms, folks. So you need to really pay attention as we go through things and, and keep an eye on all the different outlets, all the media outlets and like that. They are very good at what they do. Now, having said that, Deputy Chief Scott Young will be kind of taking the reins and, and leading us through the presentation, and he'll be assisted by the Emergency Management Coordinator, who is Lieutenant Josh Drake. Chief Young. Good evening, everybody. So it's that time of season again. Uh, I'll put a little PowerPoint presentation together here for everybody to kind of follow through. And uh, so we came close this last year, as the mayor said in the proclamation, it's been about 100 years since uh, landfall in uh, Pinellas County. Uh, last year, uh, on September 1st, we came close, about 100 miles offshore, we had Hurricane Hermine. Uh, so that's the first one in uh, Florida, actually, since 2005 that made landfall. Uh, the storm did some the damage to uh, our area. Our, our area, uh, some street flooding and stuff, a couple of homes were damaged, but we were lucky. We, we could have been a lot worse had the thing made a little bit of a right jog, so we would have had a lot more flooding. 
So, are you ready? Are your, is your home ready? Things to look at. Is your roof uh, in need of repair? Uh, it's the time of year to start looking at that. If you're thinking about it, it's a good time to get it before the storm happens because it will definitely uh, tear apart in a good storm. And the new, new roofs always have the new codes. They're a little bit stronger and should have lasted a, a storm of Category 3 or at least. Uh, shuttering windows is always a great thing. Uh, windows are very susceptible to uh, flying debris. Uh, glass can be broken. Once your glass breaks in your house, water intrudes into the home and you start getting the damage started. Uh, the duct tape ideas that we used to see people tape in the windows, that really doesn't do a whole lot. It may look like you've done a lot, but the glass is still going to break. It might keep some of the big pieces together, but it's still going to break, so it's not going to protect the home. Weather stripping around your house, doors, any windows, stuff like that, check that, see if it's, it needs to be replaced or repaired. Uh, during a storm of a significant wind, the rain doesn't just fall straight down, it's going to fly left to right in a horizontal so it will get into the house, so make sure your caulk is good and your weather stripping is up to par. Your garage door. Uh, garage doors of old are not wind resistant to, to any significance. They will uh, collapse on a heavy storm, blow in. Uh, once you start getting your wind into the house, it pressurizes your house, and that's when you see these roofs start to come off. So make sure your garage doors are up to par, and if they need to be replaced, look for something that's uh, reinforced and uh, wind rated. And then sandbags. Uh, the city does do sandbags every uh, time we have a storm in a couple different locations. Uh, the, the, the jury's still out on sandbags, whether they do a whole lot or not. Uh, but if you feel it's something you want to do, then by all means, uh, we'll provide them or have the sand available for you to uh, get, bag it up. Okay, now we move to your yard. The yard is very important. This is where if your trees are, uh, need to be cleaned out, when I mean cleaned out, clean them out so you know, there's less wind that can push the tree over. If there, there are less branches of, that don't need to be there, you get it uh, taken care of. But then the main thing is don't leave all the uh, tree limbs and stuff laying around on the ground. Uh, all you're doing is now having more projectiles in the air flying through those windows we just talked about. Uh, gutters and downspouts. Uh, I know in my house I used to have a problem <laughs> not getting up there enough to clean those things out, and they're always not fun to clean out, but it's important you keep your gutters and stuff clean so the water flows the, the correct way off the roof and it doesn't cause any other problems. Okay, yard furniture, toys, all that stuff we all have in our yards. Make sure you bring all that stuff in. Uh, when the hurricane warning is issued, that's the time to really get out and start walking the perimeter of your house. Uh, and get that stuff in. Barbecue grills that we usually have outside. Get them inside the garage if you can. Uh, we don't want anything like that flying around. Uh, you all probably seen the pictures of the two by four flying through the uh, palm tree. That does happen and that shows you the, the extent of how strong these winds can be. Uh, don't drain your pool. We don't want you to drain your pool. We want you to chlorinate it really super high. Uh, turn off the water the, uh, pump to the pool at the, at the electrical panel and all the accessories to the pool. That way the, uh, everything stays intact there. And then uh, some people I've actually seen throw their pool furniture out by their pool into the water so they don't have to try to drag it into the garage. If it just stays in the water, it's not going to fly around. All right, the vehicle. One of the most important things you might be getting in your vehicle and having to leave the area uh, if the storm is really coming. So there's some things up there that we recommend that you have in your car, some non-perishable food, a uh, bottle of water. Uh, if you're on the road and you get some traffic and you get stuck out there, we want to make sure you have some stuff to uh, you know, get through the uh, uh, traffic jams. Jumper cables, batteries die, you want to have that. Uh, flashlight, of course, uh, some type of a power inverter, and charge the cell phone to charge cell phones and other devices. You want to make sure you have all those cables with you. Uh, so. Uh, a map sh for the shelters. You might want to keep that in your car that, uh, so you know where you're going if you get lost or where you might find another one in the county. Uh, businesses. You need a go box. We want to make sure that you have uh, all your important phone numbers with you as a business, all your important documents, any contracts that you may have. You want to bring those with you uh, and uh, back up those cell phones or iPads or whatever you have. Uh, that way if you need information, you're going to have it with you on the road. Uh, if you have electronic devices in your uh, business, you might want to bring those with you if you have a laptop because uh, all that information you might not have when you get back if the storm is big enough and destroys buildings. 
Pinellas County's first call. This is similar to the reverse 911 system. Uh, it sends emergency alerts out to your cell phone if that's what you want to use. Uh, each member of the household can register their own phone. This uh, is an automated system. It's completely confidential. You don't, the, the numbers aren't given to anybody else. Uh, it can be used on land, uh, landmines, landlines and uh, text messages. Uh, it just alerts you what's going on in the county, what the county emergency management is telling us. You're getting the same information. So what storms are happening and what, what the county's plans on doing the next phase. And this is how you register for that. Uh, just the website you can go to and register for uh, the first call. Uh, on like Again, all the content information is uh, confidential. So know your evacuation zone. Uh, I will tell you that this year the zones did change. Uh, the new surge models, which I'll talk about in a minute, have changed. So flooding is expected differently. So some of the uh, maps have changed. Uh, you can get these uh, maps in the uh, lobby of the City Hall, Library, and Public Safety Building. Uh, and if you don't see them there, they run out, just get a hold of us at the fire department. We have uh, plenty there. And you also, your evacuation zone is also on your trim notice, too, if nobody uh, uh, realized that. But if you have your trim notice, you pull it out, it'll tell you what uh, zone you're in. There's an interactive map that you can go to on this website here through the county. Uh, you put in your address, and it'll exactly show you where you're at and what zone you are in today. So... Something that the mayor and uh, Chief Butcher have worked on uh, for years and now is uh, something that we're doing uh, through the county is the pet shelter. Uh, the pet shelter is down in Dunedin, Florida right now. Um, but all pets must be pre-registered. Uh, they don't want us bringing pets there. They want to kind of have an account of no, uh, the pets. I would assume, though, if something happened and you didn't get your pet registered and you showed up, I don't think they're going to turn them away. Uh, but I do believe you have to provide your own food and stuff for the pet. So make sure you bring that with you. And here's the shelters. Shelter situation, we have Tarpon Springs Middle School out here uh, as one of our shelters, and then the closest pet shelter is also a shelter down in Dunedin, at Dunedin Middle School. So preventative measures for utilities. If the storm is coming and we start going to a mandatory evacuation, we will be starting to shut down the water system in the city, especially on the west side of the city, uh, just to prevent any infrastructure damage during the storm. Uh, after the storm has passed, this water system will be turned on in different stages to make sure that there's no damage. Uh, this is for health reasons and uh, just to protect our infrastructure of the city. Okay, the projections are out for this year. Right now we're expecting an above normal hurricane season. Uh, the reason that is, is uh, forecasters are saying that the Atlantic waters are a lot warmer than normal and this, the uh, El Nino that we've been benefiting from for many years now is very weak this year. So we don't have those steering currents to push them off back out in the Atlantic, plus the warm water. So they're expecting it above normal. We all know that these are projected numbers, and as the season goes, you'll see them modify their predictions. So that may change a little bit up or down, depending on how the season's going. Here's the name of the storms for 2017. I don't know if your name is up there. But uh, as you can see, we've already had one storm this year back in January. Unprecedented for us to have a storm, but our lean was a storm uh, in January. It didn't amount to much, but uh, that's going to usually have a storm in January, but we did. So. so what's new? Uh, this year, for the first time, the Hurricane Center will now be issuing storm surge watches and warnings. When I say surge, that means water. Okay, they've never done this before. They've been piloting this program for many years, and this is the first year they're going to roll this out. They talked about it at the Hurricane Governor's Hurricane Conference uh, last month. Um, so on top of your hurricane watches and warnings you'll see, you'll probably see something by, on the news that says surge, and it'll kind of tell you where, the, where they predict the biggest surge of water are gonna, it's going to happen at. Of course, that changes just like the hurricane watches and everything change. Uh, but this storm water surge is the biggest threat to... Uh, uh, life and property. Water does more damage than it does, the wind itself does. So that's why we talked about protecting your home from any type of water. So storm surge, this is the new numbers. And on the left hand column you'll see A, B, C, D, and E. Those are the evacuation zones. The A zone, they predict if it's an A evacuation you can expect up to four to eight feet of water. If it's just an A, 
all the way up to E. If we went to an E evacuation, that means all those zones are evacuated and we can look at 30 feet of water in the town. So that's, those models numbers have changed. So watch those storm surge. Uh, watches and warnings are kind of important now. So social media is important nowadays. Everybody uh, either has Facebook or some Twitter account. Uh, we have the Pinellas County Emergency Management has a Twitter account, Facebook uh, through Pinellas County, Bright House Channel 615. Uh, the city has a Facebook page, the police department has a Facebook page, the fire department has a Facebook page, and we will be posting information on there as we get it. A lot of the information we'll be getting and posting on there will also come from that uh, first call from uh, Pinellas that you can put on your phone. So something I just wanted to point out real, too, real quick now, it just came out, there's an app out there that is free from Pinellas County called uh, Ready Pinellas. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's free on most phones. I don't think the county is charging anything for it. So you, what this thing does is it's interactive map. Like right now on mine, I have it up, and it says I'm in a zone C evacuation. So wherever you're at, during the, anywhere in the county, it'll tell you what evacuation zone you're actually in at that point. It has links for interactive maps, et cetera. So it's free. Uh, just Go to the uh, phone and download the app. So that's pretty much it for our little presentation. And again, don't have the hurricane amnesia. We put this slide up there every year because uh, we haven't had a storm and people just kind of think it's not going to happen. But it's always the question is, when's it going to happen? You know, we, we've been lucky and hopefully we continue that trend. So thank you very much. Thank you. Chief Young, thank you for the presentation. It's always informative. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, commission comments? Questions? Sure. Thanks for the presentation and everything you guys do um, on a day-to-day -day basis for the city of Tarpon Springs. Just to touch base on the sandbags, um, I know we talked before, I use a combination of a black garbage bag, that's like a yard bag, to put against my doors and then put the sandbags against that. That prevented water from getting in my house during Hurricane Hermine. So it, the sandbags don't always prevent water from coming in because it's, it seeps through the sand and can get through your house. So if you are using sandbags, make sure you use some type of plastic bag also on the backside to prevent the water from coming through the bags in your house. The sandbags, if you just put sandbags by themselves and stack them up, all they prevent is a crashing wave. Water rising goes right through them. So they have some sort of a plastic backside on them, forms like a swimming pool, and that's exactly the way to do it. You want to make sure you have some plastic or some kind of a barrier to stop the water. Because just piling up sandbags in front of your building is just intended to stop the crashing waves or a wake. That's all they do. They, they don't really stop anything else. Thank you. You know, this is a really uh, a good question that was asked. Um, the sandbags really doesn't work. When I was the manager for the central offices in uh, Verizon, what I would done there was because we had, especially in Hudson, the uh, elevation so low and the switching was getting wet every time. So we ended up uh, building a, uh, a door, a metal door that was going into a track and sealed um, and it was blocking the water from coming in. Mm -hmm. And the, the height of the door was like three feet. So probably it's something that we need to design and recommend it to uh, businesses, especially down at the dock. Well, there's a lot of, uh, one of the building codes, we don't have anybody from the building here. I'm sure Tom probably is aware, but there are some provisions in the building code. When you have a building that's below the floodplain level, you have to have these, this certain constructive barrier similar to what you're describing. So there is that in the code, but it doesn't pertain to the single family residences and some of the smaller buildings locally. But yes, that's a great idea, and I know a lot of it has to do with, with educating the public. Yes, everybody wants their sandbags, and, and I understand why, because they feel like they need to do something. But sandbags alone really won't cut it, except for the crashing waves. Yeah, the sandbags is like a tape on the windows. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Any other comments? Yeah. Are there any public comments on this item? Here, no. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are now going to item number three, which is Florida Sun Co-op program by uh, Mr. Sol uh, Silman. And just to introduce this uh, later on in your consent items, um, we'll have an item for you to vote on to, for a partnership 
um, with them. I want to thank Dory Larson for getting me in touch with Dave and coming here and give this presentation. Um, it is an offer for partnership where they're not asking for money from us or are they asking for manpower. Um, it's a partnership to try to get our citizens some good deals on solar and to increase what the city is trying to do to get the word out. So this is a great program. I've seen it at conferences before in other places, St. Pete. I saw the one in Orlando is where I saw the presentation of them. So this is around the state and uh, they'll give you what it is. And uh, hopefully in the consent item, we'll agree to be a partner in this North County co-op that they're forming. Great, thank you commissioners. And thank you, Mr. LaCurse for that nice introduction. Thank you, Dory, for helping out as well today. Um, while I explain uh, the nuts and bolts of the FL Sun Solar Co-ops. And I'm gonna speak a little quickly. I think I brought a few too many slides here, but I'm gonna speak quickly. But the, uh, the idea is pretty straightforward, so we should be okay. Um, the FL Sun uh, Co-ops are a partnership, actually, of two nonprofits. It is the uh, League of Women Voters, and another nonprofit called Community Power Networks in Washington, D.C. They are dedicated to promoting solar around the country in a variety of ways. They give communities tools with which to start various programs. Um, great. And um, what they have been doing, they've been operating in four states. Um, they're, they're located in Washington, D.C. They've been operating in uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, and Maryland for several years. I believe they've started 80 co-ops uh, in those states in these last few years. The uh, program came to Florida just about one year ago. Um, it actually didn't come. There was a Floridian who learned about that program and brought it here uh, in Orange County. In uh, the first year, there's now nine co-ops up and running around the state and at least that many in some um, level of formation right now. And there's one coming in North Pinellas uh, later this year, which is what I'm here to talk about. And um, as, a, as a quick background and for a little context, um, it's important to understand the huge potential that solar provides us. It was something even Thomas Edison in 1931, when he was talking to his buddies Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone, he, uh, he famously said, I'd put my money on solar, and I hope we uh, don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. Um, one reason, you can keep that up for just a second, Dory. Um, Certainly, I, I'm sure one reason he was excited about it was the abundance of it. That graphic on the right, it's a little crowded, but the main takeaway from that, the large um, yellow circle there is um, how much solar power the Earth receives every year. And the small circle on the left is total global energy usage per year. So we really just need to harness a sliver of uh, solar energy to, to power the whole um, the whole planet's needs. Um, it, it, I think in every 14 and a half seconds, the sun provides as much energy to Earth as we use in a single day. So it's quite abundant. And um, another prescient thing that he mentioned was that, you know, certainly someday oil and coal and gas will run out. So we're going to make this transition someday, inevitably, anyway. What's wrong with this picture is that that is an aerial view of could be anywhere Florida, and it is a bunch of naked roofs without solar on it. We, um, we unfortunately in Florida, we truly are the sunshine state. We have the best uh, solar resource on the East Coast, uh, but we are lagging in solar deployment. And um, the important thing to note about this is that the solar industry um, is, is growing hand over fist. In the last six years, the cost of solar has dropped by 80%. And um, the, the, uh, as it's come down, the amount of deployment across the country and the world has gone up at an equally steep rate. And um, there are so many states in the U.S. that are leaving us in the dust, states with far less sun. Uh, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut are way ahead of us. Um, states like Arizona is, is uh, our, our big leaders. Uh, North Carolina, states that are traditionally um, conservative politically, but they have separated as they should, any politics from clean energy, um, and the economics just are driving this. It's, it's really a question of making economic sense. And we hope to change that. So part of our mission is to help bring Florida to, some, uh, to a more leadership position. <coughs> Uh, here's a few statistics about where we're at today. We, we um, have the third best resource in the country in terms of uh, amount of sunshine, but we're currently ranked 12th. Um, 
Solar jobs, we have 8,000, uh, 8,260 uh, in the state right now. There are 260,000 people working in solar in the United States right now. That's far more than oil and coal and natural gas combined. And jobs <coughs> are being created in solar at 12 times the rate of the rest of the economy. Um, the industry is going hand over fist and jobs are <laughs> growing hand over fist. Um, some of the keys, to, I won't go over all of these. Um, the total investment in the state is um, clo getting close to $2 billion. And these investments derive tremendous returns. So there's a great ripple effect from that. And you can see the price declined 64% over the last five years, um, which is really driving, driving this whole revolution, which is, is well underway. Um, this is just a quick snapshot that um, Florida does spend more on electricity than most um, homes in the U.S. And um, as you'll see from the next slide, uh, the cost of uh, solar PV right now, if you get a solar system on your home through the co-ops, the, the point of the co-ops is to help get volume discounts for customers. I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. but. Um, Dr. James Fenton, who runs the Florida Solar Energy Center at UCF, has modeled this out and uh, determined that um, rooftop solar costs about four cents per <coughs> kilowatt hour, as opposed to 12 cents for power out of the wall right now. And in addition to that, um, the return on investment uh, is 14%, uh, varies a little bit depending on, on your location, but um, it's double digit returns with no risk, essentially. Um, this uh, is a, it's a quick slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is um, uh, points out a lot of benefits that solar provide, solar customers provide to all electricity customers. Solar, uh, contrary to some, some, some false statements that have gotten out um, in the press and such, uh, really benefits everybody. It reduces wear and tear on the grid. It reduces fuel costs. It reduces peaker power, the, the need for um, extra generation at uh, peak times of the day, um, and it, uh, it just has a lot of key benefits. The uh, Brookings Institution has done a study on this. The Department of Energy has done a study on this. Uh, numerous states have done their own studies on this, and um, solar is actually uh, a, a benefit to the grid as a whole and non-solar customers. So uh, currently, the, one of the biggest barriers is knowledge and price uh, in folks you know, deciding whether to get a solar system on their house, and that is where FL Sun comes in. Um, basically, what we do is, um, can you go ahead, Dory? Um, the, the FL Sun program and the co-op itself, uh, at its core, simply is a group discount program. We collect uh, groups of homeowners thinking about going solar, and we put out an RFP and solicit competitive bids from uh, local installers and um, solicit group discounts. Um, you can keep it for just a second. Um, it is free market approach. We have competition in the market. And um, the FL Sun side of the equation brings the solar expertise, which helps guide people through the purchase process, which is important because a lot of people buying solar today would be buying their first their first systems, and it's a, there's a learning curve, and we help in that process as well. Um, so once we get the bids, um, the FL Sun program helps assess the uh, installers and the bids themselves, and then the the group uh, collectively makes a decision on an installer. Um, at that point, the installers would reach out to each co-op member individually to give them a personalized uh, proposal for their house. And um, there's no obligation for co-op members to buy. If for whatever reason they don't want to go ahead and buy a system, that's totally fine. Um, some of the advantages of um, having systems, they start paying back on day one. Um, and uh, several studies have also shown that solar does add value to your property as well. Uh, it really, it's been calculated that it adds $3 per watt uh, to the value of your home. A, a typical home, I have a system on my home, uh, it's a five kilowatt system, and um, at that, that um, number, it would add about $15,000 to the value of my house. It's cut my uh, power bills by 45%, and um, just a great investment. So the solar co-ops, uh, the way we um, spread the word is through community partnerships. 
um, which is why I'm here to talk to you tonight and ask for your partnership as well. Um, community partners can be a variety of groups from municipalities to community organizations, foundations, um, environmental groups, churches, anything. Uh, we look for organizations that have a trusted name and hopefully a, a, a big enough footprint where um, you, know, you can help us spread the word through mention on the website or an email blast or a newsletter, uh, maybe letting us table at uh, events, that sort of thing. That's how we spread the word about the program. And uh, there's a few of our, our partners and a few of our municipal partners around the state, um, Broward County, Sarasota, Orlando, um, Orange County, um, St. Pete was actually the very first solar co-op um, in the state was in St. Pete and uh, Mayor Kreisman down there was a, a huge uh, uh, promoter of our, our program. We didn't get the logo, but um, he, he was a great help in getting this whole thing started. Um, we also already do have the city of Oldsmar on board for our North Pinellas co-op and we're in talks with um, several of the other cities in North Pinellas. Uh, one aspect of our uh, program is that we put on public solar information meetings um, to just kind of raise public awareness and um, boy, we um, just give a primer on solar and talk about the basics of how systems work and um, of course the all important what's the return on investment and the, the, the important thing on this slide, um, it's a little crowded but the, the bottom line there again is the uh, rate of return on this investment um, which is you know double digit returns on investment and um, a payoff uh, generally of about eight and a half years um, to pay off a system that is warranted for 25 years and should last 30. Um, so these solar information meetings provide, uh, as I say, uh, basic knowledge, explains the, the benefits of the co-op, which is getting group discounts. And uh, we also offer a few um, financing options. Um, and the results so far have been our uh, average discounts from these group um, purchases have been 20% discounts. Um, again, the return on investment, 14%, increased property values. Um, we also really do want to support our local solar industry. Um, that's an important aspect of what we do, as well as the um, public health benefits and energy security. And that is the nuts and bolts of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Silva, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for taking the time to share with us your thoughts. Uh, about solar energy. Um, I can tell you that I'm a big supporter of solar energy. I've been, I did a project uh, seven years ago and it's still there and it's working very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I am very glad that we're going to be part of this effort. Uh, as you and I, we talked that, uh, uh, the, you know, the uh, solar energy has many advantages. The only <coughs> disadvantage that we had up to this point, it was the, uh, the cost was holding it back. Now with a 20% discount, I think it's going to be very easy for people to be able to, uh, to get solar equipment and installation. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any commission comments? Commission Gick. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Actually, I am currently looking at putting solar in my, at my home. Um, there's a group going around door to door in Oakley Village and um, starts with a V. Diator? Vivin? Yeah, that's it. Vivin. Vivin. Yeah. And it was interesting because they sh they they pull up our home on on whatever Google app Maps. that was, yeah. and they show us how much sun we're getting and everything. So, because not everybody qualifies for it, it all depends on how much sun, you know, in order for to be cost effective for you, I guess. So, um, they really hit our neighborhood hard, and they'll tell you they I see a lot of people going into uh, using their their product. So. Um, are they part of your co-op or no? Uh, they will probably be one of the installers who submits a bid to okay. us, I, I would imagine. Because I had talked to them about coming to the city and, and whatever. But anyway, this is a great program. You know, I always say that we live in the Sunshine State, and why are we not taking advantage of it? You know, um, it, it's so important. And, and they did, and I did not understand how all that worked. They explained everything, and um, it, it's amazing. You, you know, you could start selling back your energy back to power companies um, absolutely you know it, it there's just I wish more I wish more people were educated about this and and I, I learned so much and like I said I'm very interested in putting solar in my home 
Um, Terrific. If you could wait till the end of the year, join the co-op. And so, yeah, I'm glad yeah. I didn't do it because <laughs> the gentleman, you know, he texts, he says, can I come back? They, they want to um, remeasure. And I never called him back. I'm glad I didn't. Um, this, is, this is a great opportunity for our community. Um, and I really look forward to and working with you on this. This is, this is awesome. Thank and you so much. You, you hit the main points right on the head. We really do help, uh, hope, in addition to getting people discounts, to guide people through the process, um, give them um, some peace of mind going through the process. Uh, Vivian is a good company. You, you happen to uh, meet a good company. Um, there are other people out there selling solar who might not be so good. And um, there's a few horror stories about some fly-by-night companies. And um, we, we help alleviate that, thoroughly assess the companies and their bids. And, um, and this is why we partner with um, entities with good names. So when somebody comes to our website to check us out and decide whether to sign up, they can see the logos of these cities, these churches, foundations, and, and, and feel comfortable that, that we're who we say we are, and, um, and we can offer some guidance through the process and help up the learning curve. Yeah, well, thank so. you, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Commissioner Sabo. Yes, I also want to thank you for the presentation. Some impressive slides here with how much solar energy uh, we have and how little we use. Um, uh, also, um, why are we ranked number 12? Are we, is it because of eco economics or? To, to be honest with you, it's all policy. Solar technology is fantastic and getting better every year. The economics are incredible and in getting better every year. The only thing that separates the states is state policy. But, now the cost of solar is so affordable, it's, it's, it's gonna happen anyway. It makes economic sense with or without friendly state policies. So we are at an inflection point and um, you, know, you don't read about, about it in the papers all that often, how quickly this industry is growing, but you sure do read about it in the trade papers. These in, this industry is on fire. And five years from now, solar is gonna be ubiquitous. It's gonna be everywhere. And we need to be in a leadership position because again, well, I, I, I showed the one statistic, I think we have 8,200 um, people working in solar in um, Florida. California leads the country. They, they, they proactively decided to, you know, uh, uh, forward the transition to clean energy several years ago. They have 100,000 people working in solar energy. That should be us. We should be leading the country. We should be leading the world. I agree. We should be leaders. Um, I'm curious about the municipalities that are partners. Uh, Oldsmar is the closest to us. Um, how large is the participation? How is that going? Can you give us any kind of Data. Sure. Uh, it's a little early in the game right now. We, we haven't started. We won't start marketing the program. We're going to launch in September. So we won't really start promoting the program until um, our website is up, until we're live. Um, so the, um, at this point, we're talking to um, potential partners, and that's going really well. Um, it's, uh, it, we've gotten an enthusiastic um, response from pretty much everybody we've talked to. And, um, and then, as I say, the partnership really entails uh, what we would ask of, of the city or any partner is, um, as I say, a little bit of mention, maybe on a website, an email blast, a newsletter, uh, maybe uh, borrowing a venue to have one of our solar information meetings, uh, maybe having a city official speak at our press conference. We'll kick it off with a press conference. Um, and uh, that's, that's the gist of it. Well, I think it's, hopefully it's a pretty s small ask and um, it's, it's really just an endorsement in spirit. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely, Tori, did you have something to say? I was, were you asking about the number of people that would be involved, like residents that? Yes, potentially. Oh, I'm sorry, how many people uh, potentially? Yeah, I'll tell you, it's interesting. They, uh, we're getting too many people. They're, they're trying to limit it a little bit. The um, co-ops have been ramping up. The first co-op in St. Pete, I think, got 250 members. These last several are getting closer to 500 families signing up. And it, it, it's getting a little unwieldy for the installers. We're gonna try and we're gonna have our co-op open for three months and hopefully have it a little lower than 500 just to be a little bit more manageable for the installers themselves. That's exciting. Um, yeah. I definitely think that we should have a solar information meeting and inform our citizens of, of this opportunity. And, and I'm, I'm happy for uh, you guys being here and for us partnering with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I believe this is a unique opportunity for the residents to uh, save a significant amount of money um, and harvest um, this energy that's natural to our state. I just had a couple of questions. Uh, 
Is this involved battery storage at all in your co-op? Has that been discussed or looked into at all? I uh, you oh, know and coinciding with the solar. It's it's completely individual. So if you were to sign up for the co-op, um, once we as a group pick an installer, the installer would give you an individual proposal, and that would be an option for you. Um, at this point, one thing Florida does have uh, going for it right now is a very good net metering program. Um, Net metering is simply the, uh, the, the regulation that um, says that the power company has to buy back your excess. And they pay um, the same retail rate that you pay. So you get full rate for it. And um, you can almost think of it, it, battery storage is still just a little bit expensive right now. It's, it's following the same cost curve as solar is, but it's a few years behind. But uh, you, know, you can almost think of net metering as interchangeable. It's what you do with your excess power. And right now, being able to sell it back to the power company at full rate is, is um, just as good as any other option. So a lot of people oversize their um, systems on their home, sell back a lot, and essentially have little to no electric bill. Uh, what, thanks. What's the timeline once an RFP goes out for a citizen to have it installed on the roof? The, um, this, is, this is generally a three f to four month project from start to finish. So RFP going out and then actually installation on the roofs? Uh, yeah, RFPs go out, I would say it's probably another four to six weeks before we choose an installer from that. And, um, and then it's you know, a couple of months for the installers to, to get around to each person and, and uh, install all the systems. I'd say about half the people who sign up for the co-ops actually go ahead and purchase the system. But interestingly, we found in, in some of these earlier co-ops that uh, folks who didn't necessarily either get into the co-op or decide to, to, to buy through the co-op uh, came back a few months later and, um, and got systems on their own. It raised public awareness and it, it spurred the industry generally um, in the areas where they're already up and running. And can you just give me one more um, clarity? What happens if I have five years left in my roof and I need to put a new roof on and I have solar panels in my house? What happens in that situation? Well, I, 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 that would really be a question for the installer. I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I would assume they um, would probably want to do it on a newer roof. If you had that little of a roof left, they might advise not to. But um, at, the, at the same time, these systems last longer than most roofs do. So um, I believe they could take a system off, re-roof, and, and put it back on at, at an additional expense, of course, but, um, but don't quote me. But that would no, really I think, be that's, a good, I think that's an important part, though, to have um, in your presentations when meeting with citizens and residents of Tarpon Springs. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm going to find out the answer. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Silver, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. Um, the, uh, the price of the, the system, it's expensive for some people come up with eighteen thousand dollars is any financing available do you know yes there is there's there's uh we offer some referrals to um there's there's a, a good number of um banks that are offering products specifically for this and hopefully um we're going to have pace financing in pinellas county by the time this launches pace is a tr terrific program whereby um through bond issues um the uh, the county finances um, your system for you, and you repay it on your tax bill, on your property tax bill annually. And these are structured where your payments are generally less than your electricity savings, so your cash flow positive from from the get go. And it's based on the equity in your home. It has you don't need a certain uh, credit score. Um, it's it's a it's a great tool. Um, it's the, the wheels are turning to get it approved in in Pinellas, and hopefully it'll be available as well for our co-op. Yeah, thank you. Uh, solar energy water heaters are very popular in Europe. Do you see that coming here? Oh, absolutely. Well, Germany leads the world. Um, Spain, uh, the UK. Big manufacturer Siemens is the one that makes it. Yes, yes, they're doing a lot. And um, yes, I, I, I was in Germany last year. I was actually in, in the countryside and in the Black Forest and all these bucolic, beautiful, um, old farmhouses have solar. Everybody has solar in Germany, and um, and 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 their emphasis really has helped drive the whole industry. It's helped every, everything scale up, which brings costs down. That's why we're where we are today in terms of cost. Thank you, Commissioner Kick. Yeah, thank you. I had a couple other comments I wanted to make. Um, 
for Commissioner Carr, one of the criteria is um, they'll look at your roof. And that's what these people did. They came around and looked, and I own my roof's only a year old, so they came knocking on my door. And of course, to see that how the sunlight hits your roof, if, if you qualify or not. But they will look at the age of the roof to see if you qualify, to make sure that it can withstand the weight of it and everything. So that is one of the criteria they look at. And then financing is available. Um, they give you terms of like 10, 15, 20 years, things like that. And usually it is a lot lower than what your utility cost is. So that's a savings right there for you. But my, uh, my one question I had was, um, somebody told me, so there's a minimum that our energy, the, is it Duke Energy we have? I don't even know. Um, that we have to pay a minimum to them every month regardless. <laughs> do you know about that? Uh, I do know that everybody pays um, a, a service charge for the grid. It's the, it's the regular base charge, I believe, um, covers maintenance of the grid, and then we pay the fuel charges on top of that. It's not much. It's, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's nominal. Like that. Yeah, that's what I thought. So there is, so I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out, I guess I need to call the um, power company and ask them what their minimum is if we were to do that. Because I know there's a minimal cost. Like I said, it might only be 20 bucks, but they will, of course, they have to have their hands on mm -hmm. it. So. Yeah, yeah, it's nominal. But um, it, it does, you know, solar customers do help pay for the grid as well. The, the uh, power companies aren't thrilled about solar. Um, they, they really have, have kind of pushed back quite a bit. Um, as I mentioned, I have solar. I pay 45% less than I used to to my power company. And if everybody did that, that wouldn't be very good for business. So they've been, they've been pushing back and, and um, talking about how non-solar customers subsidize solar customers, which just really doesn't square with some of these um, studies that were done. And um, yeah. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to the public comments. If you have any comments or questions, please come to the podium. I'm Dr. Robinson. A um, couple questions. Uh, would you please state your name and your address for the yeah, record? Yeah, Paul Thank Robinson. A um, couple questions. If I have net metering with Duke Energy, and it's interesting that you followed the hurricane season 2017. Let's say there's a power outage and the grid goes down. Can I continue to power my house through my solar, or does my house go down? Uh, un unfortunately, your, you, um, your house would go down as well. Um, reason being, even though technically you would have a power source, um, you, you are disconnected from the grid in the case of an emergency because if there's guys working on the lines, they can get shot. It's a safety um, thing. So unfortunately, um, at this point, um, if, if we go down in a storm, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have power. You said that the battery system right now is fairly expensive. Um, is there an alternative to being on the grid so that I've got a battery or is there a way to have my cake and eat it too? If I'm connected to the grid most of the time but I disconnect after a power outage and run through the battery, can I then power my house? I, I believe you can, yes. I believe if you have storage, you can run your house off of that. Again, that would, don't quote me, that is, uh, would be a question for the installer, but I'm 75% um, sure. Okay, thanks. Last question. Um, is there a federal rebate for the system? Yes, there's a 30% um, federal rebate still on the cost of the system that um, got extended last year. That will still be in place until 2021. It'll step down in a few years, but um, these are the last few years of that 30% rebate, and that, that's significant. It's a tax credit, too. It's not a, a write off, it's a full 30% credit. And that's the first year after you install? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Baron. you. Thank you. My name's Chris Gasco. I live on Stonehaven Way. And I understand that the solar industry is a leader now in employing veterans. Is that true? Uh, yes, it is. I know there's been um, initiatives established specifically to employ employ veterans. There's, there's more than one organization focused on that effort. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, my name's Steve Williams. I live off Fox Run Drive. And to answer your question, I've had two different uh, solar estimates, and it's $15. That's what you have to pay, pay Duke regardless of what you're getting. At least that's what both of the companies told me. 
Thank you. All right. Do we have any other comments? We hear none. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank it was very so informative. Much. Thank you. Chief Police Cochin will give us an update on his five-year strategy plan. Thank you, Honorable Mayor, Board of Commissioners. Let me just get set up here and we'll get uh, going on the uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, as you know, we have a five-year strategic plan. Um, it's really a blueprint, a vision for where we want to go over the next five years. Um, as an agency and as a team, we're big believers in this because, you know, without vision, you're kind of like a ship in the ocean going nowhere. So this, this plan was actually done from the bottom up. Started with the troops, came up through the sergeant's level, came up through the major's chief's level. We had input from the community, and obviously it was brought for the commission before it was implemented, so um, pretty unique plan. Um, we like to keep it simple. Um, I have a 25 slide PowerPoint that I'm gonna go through pretty quick because city manager will get mad at me if I go over 15 minutes. So I'll get through this pretty quick and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, we look at current strengths of the department. Let me get through these bullet points here. Um, available technology, um, our technology is excellent. Um, partnering with the sheriff's office with the CAD RMS system. We also just merged with uh, the IT department in the city. Um, so we really, our technology is excellent. We have good staff. We have excellent equipment. We have excellent training. Um, agency reputation, I believe, is very good. And, and we have a lot of MOUs, and we strongly believe in partnerships. Um, community programs, um, whatever we can get involved in from a proactive perspective, we do. We think that's real important. And crime prevention, we're real big on that. We have a full-time police officer dedicated to that program and is very active in the community and working with people. Um, fleet condition, our, our vehicles are, are in very good condition. As you know, most of them are purchased through the penny fund, what you would call local option sales tax. Current weaknesses of the department, well, you know, you have strengths, you're gonna have weaknesses, nobody's perfect, we all know that. Um, staffing shortage, um, one of the things we've been trying to address to this plan um, our high level of service is, is really exemplary. And, you know, it's getting to the point where it's getting very difficult to do everything we want to do with the staffing we have. Traditionally in police work, you look at staffing per thousand and expense per capita. And if you look at that in the county, we're about average. Um, but our service level is extremely high. Um, workload increases. Um, policing in America has gone through major change, but we go back to the 50s and 60s, most people never called the police for anything because they had strong family units that dealt with their problems. Today, we're called for everything. The service, you know, demand for service and police work is just going through the roof. We're called from everything to, you know, my kid won't get in the car to go to school to the squirrel in my attic, and we go to all the calls. You know, we're big believers in that, but of course we prioritize our calls, but all across America, demand for policing is, is really skyrocketing. Retention of personnel, um, we have a new generation coming into police work, like any other generation, they have their strengths and weaknesses, but um, a lot of times they're looking, they're looking for you know, money or they're looking for something else, and sometimes it's hard to retain personnel, you really gotta compete, and we do the best we can to compete. Um, crime analysis function, one of the areas that we really need to ramp up is crime analysis. Um, we just hired, I'll cover it in another slide, we just hired a really good, crime analyst out of Virginia is going through pre-employment now, but it's gonna be a big plus for our agency to work with our detectives and patrol division. Um, and losing veteran officers through attrition, one of the biggest things going on, and it's not just in police work, it's in corporate America too. Um, when you look at generations, there's a huge gen generation gap. You got baby boomers, you got Gen X, mostly leading now. And then there's a big gap all the way down to the millennial generation. So right now we have a lot of people, baby boomers and Gen Xers that are getting ready to retire. And now we got to fill this gap and train this new generation that is going to be really burdened with a lot of people, a lot of institutional knowledge, basically leaving the profession. Um, I can retire. Major Young can retire. We have a whole bunch of sergeants that can retire. And you look at any agency, it's the same picture. You look at any corporation, it's the same picture. 
it's going to be a big challenge, and we have to step up and, and meet that challenge and pass the torch on to the next generation. That's going to be real important. Uh, opportunities, commercial growth, uh, technology, social media, intelligence-led policing. Like I said, we hire a crime analysis. We'll be ramping that up. Um, annexation. I know the city does the best it can to annex properties and kind of you know, bring more tax base into the city, but with annexation comes more demand for service. Um, networking with LA Academy instructors, this really has to do with uh, recruiting. Really, really tough task nowadays. Um, and connection with community groups. Um, you know, there's a lot of groups in our city that we're connected with, but we still want to reach out and connect with a lot more. You always look at what your threats are, just like a corporation would do. You know, what are the threats out there to you? And there are a lot. Uh, technology, the criminals are, you know, social media is just blowing us away. Internet crimes, computer crimes, I mean, it's just, it's rampant out there. Um, it's a big challenge for law enforcement. Um, Anti-law enforcement sentiment, you see, it, you see it in this country, you see things that are going on. We get very concerned about threats. We, we monitor them on social media, but um, we, can, we can also say that the amount of police officers killed in the line of duty is on the increase now. Um, police academy standards, um, <laughs> they're kind of... Um, they're kind of lowering the standards for people getting into the academy, which I don't agree with. Um, media, and, and this is what I mean by this, is social media. You know, anyone can say anything they want. You can do something, and someone can take a, a video of your officer doing the right thing, but catch one moment along that timeline that looks bad, post it, it goes viral, and within three minutes, 10 million people think that your officer's corrupt and your agency's corrupt. It's, it's a big challenge. Um, extremists, we know, we know what that is. Political climate. That can change at any time. Uh, department goals. So we get into the goals of the department and, you know, basically we look at, you know, what we want to achieve and we set goals for those achievements. Um, goal one is to maintain and enhance community service and partnerships. This, this is the core of our community policing programs. Uh, goal two is infrastructure, uh, department, equipment, things like that that support your services. Goal three is staffing and staff development. I talked a little bit about how we have to develop this millennial generation to take over and lead in law enforcement here probably in the next five to ten years. Um, goal one, maintain enhanced community partnerships. Tartan Springs Police Department will seek to maintain and streamline our approach to enhance community service and outreach. Um, some of the things we did in the first year, again we're talking about the first year of compliments, we established an operations sergeant so we look to kind of structure and streamline how we run things so he oversees um, our homeless uh, outreach efforts, code enforcement, crime prevention, canines, SROs, um, crime prevention officer, works closely with patrol and detectives to address operational needs. So it's kind of like a, a conduit to all these different services we provide. It's a full-time position to kind of bring everyone together. Even though we're small, it's amazing sometimes how when you don't have streamlined operations, how things you know, won't be as effective for you. We established a peace team, which is proactive enforcement and community engagement. And it's actually done through patrol. So these are officers that really look at specific problems and try and look at solutions for those problems. And again, we talk about going to community meetings, traffic enforcement issues, uh, surveillance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously, you know, we had a retirement with uh, Officer Ugulis, and we replaced him with Officer Hollingsworth. He already has three placements. Um, smooth transition. We knew it was coming, so uh, Jose was training. Um, Jacob Hollingsworth, so we think it's going to be a, um, a smooth transition, and we think Jacob's going to do a really good job. He's got some big shoes to fill. He knows that, but I think it's going to continue to be a successful program. Um, expansion of our current community police initiatives, we're really ramping up our bike unit. Um, you know, we have 11 certified bike officers. We want more. Um, we're looking to, you know, get better equipment into the unit. Um, traffic unit, um, part of patrol, we had some overlap shifts that focus on, on traffic enforcement and problem areas, and they also handle crashes. So that's their, their primary objective. That doesn't mean they won't handle other calls, but this kind of helps, you know, the shifts focus on community policing and problem solving when they're not taking calls. Um, when President Obama was in office, they, they came up with, um, and this is years of research, something called 21st century policing model. It really is six pillars, and we did a lot of them. We already did a lot of them, and we incorporated that plan into our strategic plan. And pillar one is building trust and legitimacy. We do that with community policing, policy and oversight, technology, social media. Pillar four, community policing and crime reduction. We do all that stuff. 
Pillar 5 is training and education. I think our training is phenomenal. And Pillar 6, we, we're working on uh, officer wellness and safety. I think we can ramp that up a little bit. But, um, but again, a lot of this stuff we've been already doing. Second year goals, um, we want to continue to expand on our foot patrols, business checks, night eyes, bike patrols, Cops and Kids Youth Center. That's always been a very strong program, very proactive program dealing with youth. Uh, Community Austin Public Schools, it's a very strong program. We still do that. We still commit to it. Crime Prevention Liaison, Neighborhood Watch, Public Housing li Liaison, that's Officer Ulrich. Uh, homeless Outreach, again, um, not only we, we did the transition with our new officer, but we're also beginning to bring patrol officers into the mix to see if um, you know, they can really ramp up and help with that program. And then one of the things we want to do in a second year is really reach out and, and develop stronger partnerships with our faith-based and business organization, contacts and working groups, more of a community policing initiative. Second year goals, um, continued six pillars, which we mostly already do, begin citizen engagement meetings, establish open forum meetings with the community. It'll be more run through Sergeant Fogno and, and Officer Ulrich, but patrol will be involved. Um, we talk about infrastructure, uh, continuous view of technology needs, maintain update list of priorities, seek to expand digital storage capacity. First year accomplished, reorganized, uh, we, we merged with the city. Big step, um, so we're all one with IT. And on the other side of the equation is Pinellas County Sheriff's Department. Um, we did consolidation of server, uh, this again this is first year improvements. I'm going fast because I have a lot of slides here. Consolidation of servers, consolidation of workstations and dispatch. Updated security networks. Um, agreement with Tarpon Spring Fire Department, so our mobile. So basically, with the Station 71 coming, now we have storage for some of our specialized vehicles that really need to be inside. So that was a big help for us, too. Um, we remodeled the downstairs portion of our building. I know the mayor just came by last week when we did the dedication of our hospital. And he's, yeah, he saw some of the renovations that we did. Our building's getting kind of old. We have solar energy or no? Not yet. Not yet. We're working on that. <laughs> Um, continue our information technology. We, we always got to continue with technology. Can you use storage committee? We have a committee that works with Suzanne to constantly assess our IT needs. Um, develop a plan to implement a program where all video and audio service used for evidence will actually be stored in our property and evidence room, another technical thing we're working on. Research feasibility of having two way computer communication from detective division or interview rooms. Again, another technical thing that we should be able to accomplish. Um, continue to train all supervised personnel on public information, also requirements. That's do it media. Um, utilize, analyze data available through ACES. This is our CAD RMS system through the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department. Goal three, um, we'll continue to talk to efficient staffing service and organizational structure analysis, seek to increase and enhance employee training, development, and wellness. Um, one of the big things about this is continued life scan. We also added a heart scan over in Tampa um, that we're putting everyone through in five years. It's a very advanced scan of the heart and lungs so we can make sure our employees are healthy. Um, we restructured again, we talked about the operations sergeant, um, extra duty and special events was moved over to my accreditation sergeant. We talked about traffic unit and the peace team. Wellness fitness center, we upgraded the whole gym. Um, I know maybe did you see the gym or I, yeah, so we did a really good job in, you know, really upgrading the gym. You know, there's, there's an old saying in police work, once you become a cop, you lose your right to be unfit. Um, First year accomplishment, at one sworn position with the work of the city manager and the commission. We're up to 50 officers now. Again, that's a part of this plan to add officers to the department to help with our services. We applied for three grants. We awarded one. Um, traffic, we, we, we always, usually always get the BVP grant, which is Bulletproof Vest Grant. That was 5,900. We did apply for three officers. Um, we were not awarded funding for those positions. We uh, also applied for traffic homicide unit upgrade. We're not awarded that. Recruitment personnel have been identified and trained. Research and development process sponsored political candidates and law enforcement candidates. Sometimes you look to, you have that really excellent candidate sponsor, put them through the academy, and you try and commit them to a three-year contract. Um, we have incorporated into our department of culture, uh, culture training into our field, our FTO program. So we've extended orientation basically where, you know, we really talk about the culture of the department and what we are, we really try and instill that upon our recruits. Um, completed process for hiring crime analysis. That position has been hired. Hopefully we'll get through all the pre-employment stuff. I don't know why these bullet points are going backwards. We have continuous set losses crisis. Um, CIT training is something that you hear a lot about. It's crisis intervention training. It's 40 hours. We have about eight to 10 officers that have been through that. The goal is to get the whole department through it, but that takes time. 
Um, second year structure, continue life scan, begin an advanced physical heart scan, we've done all that. Continue research, implement physical fitness program, more on a volunteer basis going towards wellness, continue to duck down evaluations, department staffing. Continue research grant opportunities, we always look for them. But then again, you have to, you have to find the ones that are reasonable and, and, and in this climate with the state, um, you know, looking at a homestead exemption, that, that's something that, you know, we really have to look at hard, see if it's worth our time to do. Research and recruit individual oversee uh, part-time reserve officer unit, we're trying to ramp that up. Review fund, uh, funding sponsor candidates through the academy, we've talked about that. Um, point of critical, critical interventions crisis team leader, We'll continue to train more officers in this area. And that's pretty much it. I mean, I think we've really accomplished a lot in the first year. Our goals are ambitious for the second year. But, you know, we want to keep rolling through this plan and keep, keep bettering the department and our delivery of service to the community. So with that said, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Chief Cochin, thank you for presenting to us your five-year strategy plan. Um, that includes not only the regular policing uh, functions, but also so many good programs that we have in place. Uh, as you mentioned, the SRO, the youth programs, the, uh, the homeless, which is a very, very um, important program, the Neighborhood Crime Watch, Prevention, the, and many others. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity and to thank every officer that we have for the outstanding service that they provide into the city. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I have a question to ask you. On your second year goal, you have you said that you will expand the foot patrol. Is that going to include the sponge docks in the downtown area? Yeah, we we hit the sponge docks heavy, and downtown. We're down there all the time. Um, if it's not Officer Gas and its patrols, again, we're ramping up the bike unit, our foot patrols. So we we are down there a lot. I but yes, I, I see that already. I just yep. wanna. This is something you're going to continue on, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any commission comment? Commission Siebel? I just want to thank you for the presentation and, uh, of course, thank all of the officers. I see Officer Gasson down on the docks, and I know he's worked with me in the past uh, on some situations, so I, I appreciate him and, and all that you guys do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr? Thanks for the presentation. I uh, <coughs> hope everyone knows on your staff that we support the police department here in Tarpon Springs. So. Um, I know there's a lot of things that you guys deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that uh, most of us wouldn't see or don't know what goes on. So uh, thank you for everything you're doing. I, I noticed that there is some bike units increased. Where are those bike units uh, patrolling in the areas? Primarily, you hit the docks. You hit downtown. Um, we don't really do the 19 corridor too much you know, because the traffic out there is difficult logistically. You get the bikes out there. But, yeah. you know, we get the Kmart Plaza, the old Kmart Plaza, uh, Publix Plaza, downtown docks. Sometimes we get them out to the schools in the neighborhoods, so that's primarily where we look to do that enforcement. Um, with safety and well, thanks. With safety and wellness, uh, I know there's two things um, with the wellness part: one's mental health and one's physical health. Um, are we encouraging the officers to um, reach out to mental health, um, or is that opportunity available to them? Absolutely. Um, um, we have an EAP program through the city. We have a police psychologist. Actually, after um, Officer Kondak was was shot and killed, we brought in. Um, one of the best out of Atlanta, police psychologist that deals with police shootings. And I, I was the first one to go as an example that, hey, you know, we need to, anyone that needs to talk or whatever and see um, this individual should do it. And, you know, we always, we always make it known that, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a shame to use our EAP program, which most of it's confidential anyway, but absolutely. Uh, and then on the um, physical part, it, is, is there an opportunity that is provided from the city for officers to see like a dietitian of some sort for food nutrition because that's such an important part of mm -hmm. health and a lot of times we look at make sure you're doing your physicals and heart scans and so on like that with the stresses but the impact of our, what we actually eat has such a direct impact on our, the way our bodies react and how um, reaction times and so on so I don't know if that's an area where we can improve or maybe help with uh, and along with the fire department too uh, I don't know if that's currently available today or if that's something we could look at for you guys. Well, I mean, we have the City Health Clinic. That's free. Um, we have an excellent um, health care program. Um, and, you know, we do everything can we can promote. But I'm also a believer that, you know, we can only meet you so far. You know, the rest of it, like I said, when you're a police officer, you know, we give you the gym. You have access to all this stuff. 
you know, we, we constantly preach health and fitness. So, um, you know, we can only go so far, you know, there is a personal accountability with that too. Okay. But yes, we, we have a lot of avenues for officers to educate themselves and, okay. you know, learn more about nutrition. Okay. Thanks. Mission Q. Thank you. Um, Chief, I just want to thank you um, and, your, and your team for, for everything they do for our community. You guys are amazing. I, I don't know anybody today that would, you know, want to become a police officer because there's just no respect. And it, it's sad, really sad. And I, I, I commend you for what you guys do. Um, but I do, I want to thank you again for, like, the community meetings. I know there was... I don't remember what officer it was. I think they made at McDonald's or something, had coffee with, with the com people in the Yeah, community. coffee with a cop. Yes. Yep. And I heard a lot of positive feedback from that. So hopefully you can continue to. Yeah, those are, those are excellent. I try, I try, command staff, we try and go to most of them. Um, they're excellent. I mean, people just talk and, and you, know, they wait, you know, it's just one on one communication. And the last one we did was at uh, Yankee Bean. Oh, it was very okay. successful. Yeah, good. good. I hope hope we can keep that up. And then, you know, the bike patrols, which I just spoke about previously. Um, I think that's a great idea. I, by accident, I ran into a couple of officers on bicycles, and I think that's a great idea, especially in our community. Mm -hmm. You know, in the smaller parts of town, um, if they can keep them up in the public area, that would be great. Yeah, those those sounds are important. Yep. Um, but I think that's a um, a great um, thing that we're doing there, and and just and just keep applying for as many grants as you can. You know, and you know, you know how that goes. I mean, we never guarantee anything, but um, just, you know, keep your eyes and ears open and, and apply for whatever grants we can get. The officer grants we're going to have to be careful with because we don't know how bad the homestead exemption is going to hit us. Right. And a lot of times with those grants, you're going to have to commit to at least two to three years after they expire. There's a bunch of strings attached that you can't reduce staffing. So, you know, everything is strategic. You got to look at these things. But yes, um, every grant that comes by, we take a look at. You know, and that's all we can do. And, you know, we're here to support you and, and, yep. and your team. And um, thank you for everything. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to the public comments. <coughs> do you have any public comments on this item? Hear none. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> we are now going to the uh, addendum uh, <coughs> number one, which is a discussion on the Anklo River dredge project. You probably already know that the funding was uh, vetoed by Governor Scott. Mr. Lequeris, you want yes. to start? Yes, um, this is an item that has to be put on the agenda by Commissioner Sieber, so I'm going to turn it over to her to, to begin. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yes, I did ask for this to be added to the agenda tonight uh, when I heard from Representative Sprouse and Senator Latvala that our request for funding for the Anklote River Federal Channel <clears throat> dredge had been vetoed by Governor Scott. Uh, this funding would have enabled us to move forward uh, with our dredge project and would have helped us secure a spoil site which is needed before we can obtain any federal funding. We're thankful to the county for pledging $300,000 to help us begin this project and securing this, this spoil site would have been the next step. <clears throat> Although I was specifically told by Representative Sprouse <coughs> and Senator Latvala that the veto will not be reversed by the governor, we cannot just throw our hands up and and defeat and, and do nothing. We must try to continue to fight for some type of funding for this important and crucial project for the city of Tarpon Springs. Governor Scott stated that he wants more funding for economy and tourism. How does this project not meet these criteria? We learned some interesting data from an economic impact study that we conducted last year in reference to this project, and I'd like to uh, tell you about some of the data. Uh, the Anklote River is the source of $250 million for marine commerce and tourism industries in the city of Tarpon Springs and Pinellas County. 50 marine-related businesses and more than 100 tourism businesses are located on or near the Anklote River. These industries provide almost 2,500 primary employment jobs in the Tampa Bay area, with 20% of the, that workforce being in the city of Tarpon Springs. And Tarpon Springs attracts 1.1 million visitors annually, and that's just some of the data that was, was collected uh, and a few of the findings. With a special session scheduled in Tallahassee this week, we want to make sure we put all of our efforts into reaching Governor Scott and our legislators. You will be hearing a resolution that was drafted tonight. If passed, it will be sent along with a cover letter to the mayor's office and a copy of our economic impact study plus a funding package to the governor and Representative Sprouse and Senator Latvala. We have also posted links on our city Facebook page for any citizens who want to voice their thoughts or concerns 
to the legislators. I want to add that I did receive a call from Representative Sprouse yesterday. Although he stressed that the governor would not reverse his decision, he stated that there will be some restructuring of funding, of funding which would include economic development and infrastructure going to the DEO Department of Economic Opportunity. With the Anklo River Dredge falling into these types of programs, there may be a possibility of receiving some funds from the DEO. Representative Sprouls mentioned that he would be talking to Senator Latvala and that he would also be talking to uh, or reaching out to Congressman Billy Rockus and Senator Nelson after the special session ends to educate them on the possibility of acquiring funds uh, from the DEO for the Anklo River uh, <coughs> Dredge Project. I want to thank Vice Mayor Banther, who's not here tonight, for initiating this project almost two years ago, along with our board, the city manager, Karen Lemons, uh, Bob Robertson, our Marine Commerce Committee, our businesses, and our citizens for all their hard work on this project, which is vital to our economy. I urge you all to voice your opinions and concerns to the legislators that I mentioned so we can move forward with this project. We cannot wait another year for funding on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Seaver. Um, after uh, we heard this negative news, I uh, called Governor Scott on his cell phone, called him several times, but I couldn't get hold of him. So uh, just yesterday, his secretary answered the phone. And uh, I gave her the, uh, the message about, and I explained to her the importance of this project, and also that uh, the Anklo River is so important to our uh, local economy. And we have you know, so many businesses that, depending on the uh, uh, on the Anklo River, uh, not only the marine businesses but the uh, tourist uh, businesses as well. Uh, also, I explained that to her that uh, uh, the boat captains are telling us that the navigation of the river is unsafe and is very concerned. Many times they have to wait for high tide in order for them to get in. And it's not always the best thing to do, especially when you have a bad storm out in the Gulf and they must have come into the Gulf, I mean, come into the, into the river. But we're not going to stop. We're going to continue working on it. Right now, we need to regroup, and we're going to have an action plan. So we're going to get it done sooner or later. Uh, Vice Mayor Panther was not able to be here today. But he left us a memo that I'm going to ask our city clerk to read it. I want to thank Commissioner Sieber for putting this item on the agenda for discussion in my absence. I have personally been working on the Inkloat River Dredge project for almost two years, as this project is crucial to maintaining our working port, which is a major economic driver in Tarpon Springs and Pinellas County. I was very upset on Friday afternoon when I received the news that the funding for our spool site was vetoed from the state budget due to the budget deal between Governor Scott and Speaker Cochran. If there was ever a project worthy of state funding, one that drives tourism and provides thousands of jobs, it's the maintenance dredge of our working waterfront on the Anklo River. I am very discouraged that Representative Sprouls and Senator Latvala were unsuccessful in securing funding for the spoil site despite numerous assurances from them. I do think, I do thank them both for their efforts and I support whatever they can do moving forward to secure state funding for the spoil site. As we move forward with this project, I believe we must focus on different funding options for the spoil site. We cannot afford to wait another year for the state budget. We must also not lose sight of our next major hurdle, which is securing a spot in the Army Corps of Engineers budget through Congressman Bilirakis for the physical dredge of the river. The hard political lesson that we have learned is that we as a city, and especially the Board of Commissioners, must play more act, an active role in future lobbying with decision makers on the state and federal level. By way of making better use of our economic impact study, we must constantly be reminding them, especially in person, that any funding for the Anklo River Dredge Project is funding that supports jobs, tourism, and environmental preservation. I support whatever decision the Board of Commissioners make in my absence, I am in full support of Resolution 2017-24, requesting restoration of funding for the dredge project. Vice Mayor David Banther. Can I add something? Thank you. You want to say something? Yeah. Yes. Um, 
after reading this letter, yes, I agree that we do need to uh, do better lobbying. But I was in Tallahassee in February. I spoke to uh, Senator Latvala and um, Representative Sprouls. And even in February, we we're still being assured that this funding was going to uh, come through. So it was quite a shock last Friday when I got a call uh, from both of them that um, the governor had vetoed this funding. And so this is why we need to make sure that we approach the governor, approach our legislators, and, and tell them that we need to continue to fight for this uh, funding from any source we can get. City Manager. Yes. Actually, it was a great time to be in Orlando at the State City Manager's Conference on Thursday and Friday because from the time we heard of the Thursday night behind closed doors budget deal, um, we spent a lot of the days Friday, again, everybody from around the state getting information. And when I called Karen Lemons mid-afternoon, we kind of all figured out that we were going to all get shafted and there was going to be most of our project cut. Although we were even assured at 3 o'clock that the project was probably going to be funded and they didn't say any problems. Of course, three hours later, we got the call that, um, that it was cut. Um, so we began preparing Friday before the news came of, of what we had to do. And I really want to thank Karen Lemons for the weekend, working on the weekend to work on the resolution and um, for the game plan that we got. Um, a reporter called me and... I told her, you know, about what was going on tonight, and we're asking to overturn the veto. And she said the same thing as, as Mr. Sprouls, that, oh, you have no chance of doing that. And I told her, again, if you can change an entire state budget in, in back time door meetings, anything can happen. In reality, can it? Probably not. But what can happen is there is money in that state budget, as, as you said. There is money in that deal. So maybe the exact category that we got veto won't be back in there but there's money available and the one thing we got of course our biggest biggest thing we're fighting against is politics because if you go on the merits you know i'll put our project up any of the ones in the state um i'll probably put them up against most of the ones that got left in the budget and the true merits of economic development of jobs of vitality to a region you know, we don't need political help. We stand on our own. That study showed us that it's our project. So there is funding going to be there even if this veto isn't reversed, if it's not put back in, which is not, there's still going to be money available that we got to keep fighting for and try to get. But I also want to assure everybody, when we were given this project as a city and city team working with you, um, we knew there would be pitfalls. We always, I think I get that from law enforcement, we always plan for the worst to happen. So there was already a plan in place. For instance, if we didn't get the county money, we had a plan in place. We had a plan in place if we didn't get this state money. Um, the only place there's no contingency plan is, is when it gets to the federal and the federal dredging of four or five million, we have no contingency plan. We have to have our congressmen get that federal funding because that, but in this case, we already have chosen the, the dredge site. We are already paying rent with the money that this commission uh, put in the last budget for Penny of Pinellas. Now, now that money was going for some studies that we had to do and some other things that we had to do to prepare the site. We probably spent about a hundred thousand, close to a hundred thousand, but there's still plenty of money left to keep paying the rent in the spoil site to continue. If you remember, what we did with the penny was put a just in case amount. In next year's budget to do so so there will be no stalling of this project we we are going full force in it while we continue to fight for other fund sources of funds <coughs> and to get the state money reserved we the the study is going on county came through for us um again that money you put away that three if the county wanted to come through we had had to use that money to do that well they came through for us so we've got this money available so so we need to continue the fight, go forward, get the money where due, but the project is too important. It's not going to be installed. And thanks to your wisdom and this commission, what they did, we can keep going until we fight and, and get the money we deserve. Thank you, Mr. Leclerc. As it was said, we will get it done. Commission Kick. Thank you. And that was one of my questions is we're paying on that spoil site. So um, 
we need to keep fighting. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, but seriously, I mean, this is something I can tell you, I can assure you that the people sitting here on this board will fight as much as we can. And, and when I got that phone call Friday afternoon, very disappointed. I, 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 I just couldn't even, I couldn't even think about what was going on. I was just, I was shocked that, that this would happen to us. And that dredging is so important to this community um, for our tourism to keep our working waterfront going. And I just, I, I'm just flabbergasted about the whole thing. But Commissioner Sebe, you talked about a Department of Economic Opportunity. Is it so possibly they could have funds available? Well, they may be restructuring some of their funding, according to uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, Sprouls, and maybe there's a possibility that some of that funding could come to us. So, so there are, might be other avenues for us, because right. I honestly don't think that um, our governor is going to change his mind yeah. at this point. But we will fight. <clears throat> I, I promise you that. Thank you. Commissioner Kohler. Uh, I echo a lot of the comments that were said already tonight. Um, I've also reached out to uh, Representative Sprawls, uh, Senator Lavala, our county commissioners, and also the governor's office, uh, requesting um, just an, multiple answers and also additional funding uh, for future allocations, similar to the economic development that has been discussed here tonight that was uh, put in the, the state's budget. So I think um, as a group, we all need to continue, and as a city, to reach out to the governor's office and our elected officials in the state and ask that the Tarpon Springs dredge project is included in the economic development package, because there is a bucket of money there to be had, and it, we've seen the direct impact based on the study of what this river has, um, such an impact economy-wise and job-wise uh, throughout this area. Um, so I... I I support this. Um, I, I would also support adding uh, any additional language that we need to um, about requesting the economic development funds as well, or if that could be a separate um, request that we do to the state. Thank you. Before we go into the public comments, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Lacourus one more time. Yes, one thing I forgot to mention is, is thanks to Karen's hard work this weekend, this packet, which included a letter from the mayor, it included the resolution that was gonna be passed, and it included the economic study that was done, uh, was done, sent out Monday, and in the governor's office this morning. So that we made sure got to the governor's office. It's there, reminding of the economic study. Again, nobody's sure who actually did the cuts, whether him or his team or whoever, but that was personally delivered with this resolution. That's another reason why it's important to pass that resolution. And yes, we can come back when they set up this economic thing and do other ones, but we told them it was coming. We told them it was deserved to be in there. We already sent them the resolution and said tomorrow morning, the clerk, Wednesday morning, the clerk is going to send them the signed one that we're all going to approve and encourage this stuff. So again, that's, that's the other reason we deliver and told them we can do it. And you know, I'm sure in the next item you're going to bring up, we'll deliver that resolution, and we'll continue. If they set up something, we'll go after that money and do the same thing with <coughs> another resolution. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. We are now going to the public comments. If you please state your name and your address for the record. Yes, Joan Jennings, 2204 Pine Drive, and I'm also a member of the Marine Commerce Commission. Um, the dredging project is a project that's long overdue. It's every time we delay it yet again, the damage to the environment and the cost increases. It's not only important to Tarpon Springs, but it's important to the entire region in a lot of different areas. Fishing, tourism, recreational boating, commercial shipping. Uh, Duckworth Steel Boats just launched a uh, steel boat, the uh, Hogarth, for the, uh, that was uh, commissioned by the Florida Oceanographic Institute. And it's, Duckworth is a longstanding tarpon business that employs a lot of people and brings a lot of money into the area. The boat could only be gotten out of uh, Duckworth uh, on a full moon high tide. You know, this type of thing is really unacceptable. It really straps unnecessarily all of the local industries that are bringing lots of money into the area. 
Uh, all of that was demonstrated in the economic uh, impact study that was commissioned and uh, that's going to be sent to the governor. And I'd also like to encourage every citizen to contact their legislators, especially the governor, to petition him to overturn the veto or uh, allocate otherwise available funds for the project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Jack Russell, 616 Island Drive. But, uh, I think we read through your uh, resolution, but I think you ought to make a bigger statement on what a safety issue that it is. I mean, we, there's a lot of boat traffic, you know, in the river and a lot of accidents, you know, people being killed and everything else. But a lot of places we have to go on the wrong side of the channel or, or outside of the channel, you know, to make it through the river. And a lot of times we're carrying, you know, my boat holds 10,000 gallons of fuel some of them hold 20. You know, you have an accident, you spill that fuel, you know, it's, it's going to have an eco, uh, ecological impact. You know, they ought to stress the fact of, of the safety. You know, it's a safe harbor to come in from a storm. And there's a lot of traffic in the river. We try to stay out of it on the weekend. But I, I think they ought to stress that a little bit more. You know, because we have a decent channel, it's going to be safer. We all know about all the accidents on the river. Thank you. Any other comments? Adeli, you have something to say? No? Okay, thank you. We are now going to uh, addendum number two, which is resolution 2017 24, <coughs> requesting restoration of the funding for uh, Anklo River dredging project. City Attorney will read the uh, whole resolution. Resolution 20. 17-24, Resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, imploring the Governor and Florida State Legislature to restore funding for the Anclote River Dredge Project and providing for an effective date hereof. Whereas the Anclote River is the source of a $252 million marine commerce and tourism industry in the City of Tarpon Springs and Pinellas County. And whereas more than 50 marine-related businesses and more than 100 tourism businesses are located on or near the Anclote River and depend on the river for their livelihood. And whereas these industries provide nearly 2,500 primary employment jobs in the Tampa Bay region, which represents 21% of the workforce in the city of Tarpon Springs. And whereas Tarpon Springs accounts for 56% of the value of all commercial fish landed in Pinellas County. And whereas the Anclote River Federal Channel requires maintenance dredging to maintain and advance its regional impact on commerce, tourism, and shipping, its ability to serve in a regional public safety and disaster preparation and response capacity, and its ability to provide a harbor of safe refuge for vessels in danger. And whereas the Anclote River was last dredged 17 years ago, and in its current condition is impassable along several areas of the channel, causing a loss in commercial fishing operations. And whereas the U.S. Coast Guard issues weekly warnings to boat captains called local notices to mariners, which inform them where navigation is unsafe due to shoaling. And two areas in the Anclote River Navigation Channel have been on every weekly notice since October 2014. And whereas the city has established a Marine Commerce Committee comprised of concerned residents to advise on river conditions. And whereas the City of Tarpon Springs, Pinellas County, Marine Commerce Committee, U.S. Coast Guard, and Army Corps of Engineers are jointly working together and have toured the river to assess and confirm the need for a dredge. And whereas Pinellas County has pledged $300,000 to support the project. And whereas the Tampa Bay Congressional Delegation supports the project and has jointly signed a letter attesting to the need for a dredge. And whereas a spoil site must be secured prior to obtaining federal funding for the dredge, and the state Senate and House have approved $920,973 to provide for a spoil site for the dredge. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, that the City of Tarpon Springs respectfully requests that the $920,973 allocated for the Anclote River Dredge Project that was included in the state of Florida fiscal year 2018 budget and was vetoed by Governor Rick Scott be restored to the state of Florida fiscal year 
2018 budget. Copy of this resolution shall be sent to Governor Scott, Senator Latvala, and Representative Sprouls. This resolution shall become effective upon adoption. It's resolution 2017-24 in full. Thank you. Are there any additional commission comments on that? Commission Carr? I've got a quick question. Um, I appreciate the comment you brought about the safety. Um, <clears throat> there is a lot of recreational use on this river, and uh, with the commercial boats going in and out of the river, um, and if they have to cross the channel multiple times or come in and out in certain areas, that is creating a, a very large safety concern that's not addressed um, for the recreational boaters. It might be someone that might boat once a month or once a year or, uh, or someone down on vacation also. So um, to have possibly you have a lot of educated voters that are out there, but then you have a lot of uneducated voters or less experienced ones. So um, I know the city manager mentioned that this is already sent to the, the governor's office. Is there an opportunity to add uh, an emphasis for the stress of safety? Because if we have a U.S. 19 of safety issues, that's going to be reported. We have a U.S. 19 of a waterway right here in our backyard that I think we need to report a safety issue with also. Although safety is highlighted in some of the points, uh, I, I would agree that um, that part could be emphasized stronger. Being that the package is already gone there and will be received by the governor tomorrow morning. Actually, it should be there today, isn't it? This, this morning. This morning? Yes. It's probably, and, yeah. I think it's kind of mixing up the uh, information. I think it's good to stick with it. And I think the uh, the points were very well made on the navigation, that it's unsafe, and it's very difficult for the big boats to come in. I think we... Uh, in my opinion, is we'll let it go the way it is now, since the governor already have it on his desk. Can someone just clarify for me real quick, uh, since it's not signed on our end, um, the resolution? Is it the signed resolution then sent to the governor's office and the senator's office and the representative, or is it just no. the resolution is sent up there? It is explained that it was in pass. I mean, it was not voted yet. Okay. It was explained on the letter. I think you got a copy of it. So how come additional information can be added to it? I'm, I may be you, you missing can, something obvious. So. Let, let me make it clear. You, you can. I mean, he, you can add anything you want. You just have to have the exact language. We have it, have it you know, where it's going to be added because the clerk has to send it out first thing in the morning. So, but you, you can. You do have the option to add something to it. Can I mention something? Uh, it does say uh, have warning issues from the Coast Guard um, to mariners, which would include Is recreational there. mariners. So um, I think that we have covered uh, the safety issues. I, I just wanted to um, point that out um, in, in, several, in a couple of places here. Um, so I'm not sure how we would need to add more language to that. What? language do you think it should be placed in there to satisfy you? Can you? I'm, uh, I'm not going to be able to throw something at you right now off, off a whim. Um, but yeah. I, I'm too I mean, if you, through discussions, I mean, it sounds like the, the consensus of the board is that there's enough right now, so. Okay. I, I'm okay with moving forward with it. All right. Any other comments? No, it, there is safety that in at least two paragraphs that I've seen mentioned um, in this resolution. It does say that uh, the uh, Coast Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers are jointly working together to have um, that they're providing information and uh, it's a safety concern that's there. Uh, Commissioner Sieber? What's your take on that? Well, I, I just feel like it is listed here a couple of times, and there are uh, Coast Guard warnings to boat captains, which would include not only uh, businesses, but also, I, I think, com uh, not only commercial, but also um, uh, recreational boaters. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to take more time and not get this. I think that, you know, 
it's crucial that we get this to the governor and have it signed. So, but of course, the um, point is well taken. In future documents and in future, because I'm sure we'll be doing some more of these. Um, right. We'll make sure we we add a add little more on that future. on that safety issue. We yeah, I understand. Time is of the essence on this situation, so I, I think it is an important thing to continue to add when we're reaching out to the representatives, if it's yeah. congressmen or senators or whoever may be. Also, to stress that. Yes. Are there any uh, public comments on this item? Here none. The chair will entertain the motion. Motion to approve. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alahuzas? Yes. Thank you. And good luck to all of us. Uh, we are now going to the uh, consent agenda, which is item number five, the attorney fee invoice. 87998. Six is a special events July 4th picnic in the park. B is the uh, fireworks July 4th, 2017. Seven is approved city partnership with uh, Florida Sun and North Country uh, County Solar Co op. Number A is to extend the file number 150063 C JJ maintenance, repair, and operating supplies through Florida State contract. Number 450000-11-ACS. Nine is ratified increase the bid number 150090-B-RS chemicals for the uh, reverse osmosis water plant. Number 10 is the award uh, RFE number 170018-P-CM. The breach removal disaster recovery service number 11 is increased number 170022 that's B that's RS temporary personnel services and number 12 is increased file number 170132 that's R this RS revenue generated contract for density classes are any items that you like to pull for discussion I would just like to make a comment. Of course. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Com uh, City Manager, for the Fourth of July picnic in the park again. And thank to our thanks to our sponsors. We couldn't do this without sponsors um, that helped pay for this event. It's free to all our um, <coughs> residents, and um, it's fun. It's a lot of fun to go out there. It brings the community together. And again, that we have fireworks back on um, or still on our list is. Uh, Wonderful. But that's another event. If you are a boater, everybody comes out by boat, watches the firework display, and it's, it's really pretty cool. Um, or you can go out to the beaches and what, not to watch it. But um, th these are two, two events that really bring <coughs> the community together and show how, what a tight-knit community we have. So thank you for keeping that up. Thank you. Any other comments? Here or not, are there any public comments on this item? I need a motion. Motion to approve. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor who's this? Yes. We are now going to the item number 14, <coughs> which is to authorize purchase of uh, the next uh, vacant property, northeast corner of North Street of uh, Mango Street. The partial number is 1827 that's Dash zero zero three dash zero one one zero. Okay, let's get the item on here. Okay. Yeah, number thirty. We skipped. The we did. Yeah, we had a uh, administrative. Apologize that we missed one. So I'm going back. <laughs> item number thirteen is request to settle administrative fine for lien seven forty two Upper's Court. Thank you, Mayor Commissioners. I'll keep it brief. You've received my report. This concerns the property located at uh, 742 Arthur's Court. We have code violations dating back to, or fine dating back to September 20 of 2013 that uh, followed a series of violations and hearings um, beginning in May of 2013. Uh, we have Total principal of about $22,400, which includes a $47.42 utility lien. Uh, I'm recommending uh, settlement in the amount of $2,000. Uh, 
plus 575 in administrative costs for 2,575. Uh, that is $2,000 in excess of that offered by the owner to settle, which is the administrative cost solely of 575. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Any commission comment? Uh, yes. Sure. Uh, this has been going on a long time, and uh, I make a motion that uh, we take uh, our attorney's recommendation for the 2000 plus administrative 575 costs. I'll second. Which, which is the uh, city attorney recommendation. Right. Thank you. I'll second that. We got first to second. Any other comments? Uh, can I just uh, have either maybe some clarification on the city manager or the city attorney on um, how we come up with deciding what properties? I know we've had some in the past before. I was a commissioner that were in the five or ten thousand um, dollar areas for um, the fines that were agreed upon by the board, and then. I know last commission meeting or the one before that, we had an element was reduced to just administrative costs. So I don't know if there's something of precedent that, or some type of guideline we go by. Uh, if I could just have some clarification, that would be helpful. Yeah, there's there's no, uh, this is not science. It's more art and it's not even good art. And at some point in time, and Mark may become upset with me for saying this to you tonight, but uh, you know, this policy is very difficult to administer. It's, it's imprecise. It leads to some, um, some inconsistent results frequently. The process itself is uh, prescribed by, by the policy y'all have adopted several years ago uh, when Attorney Yakubo was city attorney. Um, it, it, this is somewhat of a, uh, um, an imprecise analysis. You know, we try to take into account the factors that were set forth in the policy. Um, the level of cooperation we've received from either the original violator or the subsequent landowners, um, the nature of compliance. So I wish I could tell you, Commissioner, that this was subject to some sort of a uh, um, scientific or more precise calculation analysis, but it's really not. I mean, we try to be as consistent as we can uh, in my recommendation, uh, but I understand that the, the no, no two cases are alike. Being doing this for a long time as police chief trying to influence this and not, while it's not precise, um, we do look at a lot of factors in there. And, and there's input when this settlement is sent from Jay, we send it to code enforcement, building all the people involved. The biggest thing we weigh is what was the extent of damage to the surrounding community, the neighbors that was done from it? What extent did the people involved have a process in it? But again, you also have to look at even if these people go on a foreclosure or buy the land for real cheap, they're buying it knowing that these things are on there. So, well, you know, you really want to sell for administrative costs. You knew you got this at half price because it had $100,000 of lien on it. Is it fair to give you that? No, there was an impact on a neighborhood for two, three, four years. Um, we used to use a 10 to 15% like thing for things like that, but sometimes when when the fines grow to 140, that 10 or 15 cent were stream. So we mainly kind of get to a couple, is it worth a couple thousand? Is it worth 5,000? If it's real severe, 5,000, you know, we kind of we kind of went somewhere in that range. So while there's not direct science, there is a methodology to it um, based on it. And for this one and stuff, the impact to the neighborhood for a long time, it was about a $2,000 figure to add on it was kind of, the long-term impact to neighborhood that happened to kind of decide as a, as a fair thing for it. If it's the same owner and he just completely ignored and thumbed their nose at us, then there, we might go the 10 or 15% to a five or something thousand, but that's how it kind of looked at. A couple of the ones, a lot of the ones that are reduced, the impact really wasn't that great to the community. So we really had no objections and stuff, but, um, because there was really little, even though the fines had got up to 40, 50, it really, didn't have a big impact like, you know, the hoarder house we had with all the stuff, you know, the places where you wouldn't want to do. So you just try to do a common sense um, and add to it and stuff. And that's what the attorney does, does very well. We know the process needs some work and some consistency, but it's hard, again, putting, you know, when we put the numbers on it, sometimes when they were way up there, even the 10 or 15% wasn't fair. So we went to just 
kind of a common sense, what was it worth as opposed to what harm it did to the neighborhood compared to who has the property and what extent they had to the problem. And you come up with a number. And then this board, well, maybe that's too high. We go half of that. We go by the thing. And this board kind of takes that and, and comes to a decision. So that's kind of how it's been done for, for a while. Where do the funds go once, I mean, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask this right now, but where do the funds go once we receive these funds? General fund. General fund, okay. Yeah. Uh, I will ask to ask our city attorney, do you think this process should be reviewed and bring us some recommendations? Yeah, you can say yes. I well, know. since you asked, yes, I do. I, you know, I periodically talk to uh, Mr. Yakubo and I say, gosh, I, you know, I really so much enjoy working for the city, but this process you put in place, I would like to hit you over the head with something heavy <laughs> for that. I, uh, you know, I, it's a process that was put in place, you know, during the height of the uh, foreclosure crisis, and I think it had a place at that time. It, it frankly has since outlived its usefulness of the 10 municipalities that we represent in our law firm. This is the, we are the only city that has a process even close to anything even like this. I mean, it's a, so yeah, the answer to your question uh, is a resounding yes, please. Thank you. So we'll work on that and bring something back to you. Okay. We are now going to the uh, public comments. Any public comments on this item? Here, none. Uh, well, we have a first, a second. And I need a roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes. We are now going to the item number 14, which is to authorize the purchase of a vacant property, northeast corner of uh, North Street and Mango Street. Uh, this property will be used for stormwater pond to correct the flooding problem that we have. Mr. Le Quiris, would you please explain that? Yes. Um, this, this problem is, this um, buying of this property is mainly due to the Mirrors Project. As we know, the Mirrors Project is eminent um, from the side of the shop, the, the apartment complex. And of course, their requirement for doing the complex is completed the road, but we still have our section from Mir from uh, Distin um, to US 19. And we've been looking at for a while the problem of, as you know, the dip, if you're going towards 19, the dip there. And as it got closer and we got into the surveys, we found out that there's probably no way we can do it without putting an underground vault, which is very expensive. One of the only alternatives was to, to try to secure a piece of land on the corner, which, which frankly, I had a lot of doubts that we could get a hold of. But thanks to the good work of Gary Sherman, and uh, if you all know Gary, uh, he's the guy I send out to angry neighborhoods and, <laughs> and to deal with hooking up the sewer and all those things because he's such a personal individual. He did work out a deal with Mr. Burroughs. I know the deal seems higher than the property is, but the value to us in the city is going to save us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and if we'd have gone any other process, I mean, the made or something like that, it'd cost far more than we're paying for the property to do. So for us in the city and for our portion of the Mirrors Project, which I understand the apartment park's done, they're almost there on the road, so they're going to be coming to us and saying, we're ready to go, which means we need to kick our end going, and we need this property, or else we'll be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars extra to secure the drainage on ours. So it's a very good deal. and. Uh, we'll be able to get our part of years uh, put through at a savings to the taxpayers. Thank you. Well, I'm glad this property became available because uh, we paid $60,000 $60, for the property, $50,000 for construction, $110,000 for the whole project, which is very, very economic. Yeah. Any uh, commission comments? Commission speaker. Yes, I agree that uh, having this property is important. There is a $15,000 difference, so me being cheap, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you do say that you're going to do due diligence before you uh, accept the clo at the closing. So I just want to make sure we, you know, can negotiate. That's my comment. Um, I yeah, it is paying a premium, uh, I think, for the lot. But at the same time, um, what the cost would be behind a vaulted system would be in incredibly much more. So, um. In this situation, I, I think it's going to be a good situation for the city. Okay, thank you. Are there any uh, public comments on this item? <coughs> Here, none. The chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes. 
Thank you. Mr. Liqueurs, you got your marching orders. Yep. Thank you. We are now going to the uh, item number 15, which is the ordinance 2017-20. This is the application 17-43, rezoning amendment for uh, Mrs. Galusis. 620 Bayshore Drive from R100 to R100A. This is the first reading, and this is a quasi-judicial. City Attorney will read the title, will explain the quasi-judicial process. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This uh, hearing is quasi-judicial, as, as is the, uh, the conditional use application following it, uh, Resolution 2017-21 at 1430 Eleanor Boulevard. So I would ask if, if you're here for either of those items, uh, to please listen to the procedures and to be sworn at the end when requested. Uh, these are quasi-judicial proceedings where the commission acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. As such a hearing, it is not the commission's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the commission is required to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented and apply those findings to previously established criteria contained in the city's code. The commission may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If that evidence demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the code, then the commission is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if that evidence uh, fails to meet the criteria established in the code, then the commission is required by law to find against the applicant. All witnesses must give their testimony under oath. All persons testifying must give their name and address for the record. All testimony and questioning at this hearing must address matters that are relevant and material to the issues under consideration. The city staff will present its testimony and evidence first. The applicant will have an opportunity to cross-examine city staff. The applicant will present its testimony and witnesses. The city staff will have an opportunity to cross-examine the applicant's witnesses. Members of the public opposing the application will be given an opportunity to present testimony. After all, members of the public speaking in opposition have concluded. Members of the public in support will have an opportunity to present testimony. Each member of the public is limited to four minutes. The applicant will then have an opportunity to make a closing argument or summary, after which city staff will be given an opportunity to make a closing argument or summary. Following this, the commission will consider the matter. Commissioners may ask questions of witnesses. Uh, at this point, a motion will be made and a vote will be taken. At this juncture, I would ask for the Board of Commissioners to please disclose any ex parte communications on either uh, item 15 or 16. Seeing none, I'd ask for witnesses uh, who intend to testify tonight on either application to please stand and be sworn. I ask you to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, our first application is Ordinance 2017-20, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida amending the official zoning map of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida for approximately 0 0.8 acres of real property located at 620 Bayshore Drive, app 17-43, from R100 to R100A, providing for findings and providing an effective date. First reading of Ordinance 2017-20 by title only, second reading to be held on June 20, 2017, Ordinance was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on April 28, 2017. With that, we will turn to Ms. Erwiller for staff presentation. Thank you. Heather Erwiller, Planning and Zoning Director and staff for this application. Uh, again, this application is a rezoning request from R100 to R100A. Uh, essentially, what's happened on this property is this property was developed. It's two 60-foot wide lots that were developed in 1954. At that time, your zoning code... Um, allowed for 60 foot wide lots. Since then, we've subsequently changed the zoning code in 76. As a result, we established the R100 district. At that time, we changed the required um, lot dimension to 100 by 75 foot wide. So as a result of that, the applicant now would like to take down the house from 1950 and would like to um, essentially be able to separate these lots. Right now they're held under single ownership because it's a 120 foot lot frontage and that's what's required to actually have a developable lot. At the time when it was developed, that was not the case. The R100A district allows for um, development on lots that are 60 foot wide lots. We have several lots and I put a little table together in the, in the staff report to show you within the half section that we're in, the southern section, 
Um, there have been several uh, recent land use changes. Uh, the la early last one went back to 2007. This north section, north right above this, you just recently um, rezoned in 2014 Bayshore Heights. So we've had rezones in this general area from R100 to R100A to allow exactly what the applicant is asking for. Asking for. The future land use on this one will not change. It's consistent. R100 and R100A are, cons are very consistent land use districts. Um, really, the difference is not the uses, um, not, it's really just setbacks. What's a, a, what the side setbacks are a little bit different. And it's really just the lot widths and the lot dimensions. These lots, even without, just of the fact that they're 60 foot wide lots are very deep. So as a result, they're over 10,000 square foot a piece anyway. So they're meeting the R100 districts for size. It's just they can't meet for frontage. So as a result, um, staff went through uh, the analysis, and I won't bore you with my long staff report here. Basically, it's consistent with the land development code. It's consistent with the policies and procedures that you've that you've done in the past in this area, and it's consistent with your comprehensive plan. And with that, I can answer any qu specific questions that you have. But staff is recommending approval of this application. Okay. Does the applicant have any questions for staff? Does the applicant wish to make an independent presentation of any kind? Okay. Do you agree with the recommendation of staff? All right. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak in opposition to the application? Members of the public wishing to speak in support? Closing statement or summary by either party? Not at this time. Mr. Mayor. Heather, uh, I want to thank you for the uh, complete staff report that you provided. I have a question to ask you. You said back in 1976, the city changed the zoning from R1AA to R100. That's correct. Did the city took anything under the consideration that because the lots were plotted years ago for 60 feet instead of 75? The, you have a section in your code that allows for development on non-conforming lots. In this case, because the applicant held those lots together for so long, they've subsequently lost the ability to develop these lots independently without a zoning change. Okay. And as you said, those lots are uh, larger than the requirements anyway. That's correct. They, they, meet, they meet the size requirements for the minimum lot size. They just don't meet the minimum distance requirement for the lot width. Thank you. Are there any other commission comments on this? Yeah, no? I, oh. Sorry. I just wanted to note that TRC also approved this and had no objections. That's correct. TRC and Planning and Zoning Board all reviewed this, and neither of them had real concerns or comments. Thank you. Chair will contain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. And roll call. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Luzis? Yes. Thank you. We are now going to the item number 16, resolution 2017-21. This is the application 17-45, conditional use permit and associates high plan. Resolution 2017-21, a resolution of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida. Approving application number 17-45, requesting a conditional use permit and associated site plan to allow for manufacturing of recreation watercraft on property located at 1430 LNR Industrial Boulevard in the IR Industrial Restricted District, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. It's resolution 2017-21. Sir Roller. Again, Heather Roller, Planning and Zoning Director and staff for this application. This, uh, this applicant is seeking conditional use permit and site plan approval to construct a 7,908 square, square foot building on a site that was used for to manufacture or will be used to manufacture boats. Dorado Boats manufactures custom zones that will be moving to the property from outside the city. The property currently is developed with uh, an existing two-story building that's approximately 6,300 square feet and is gonna be used for office and support facilities for the new manufacturing building that they're building. Um, 
With that, I'm gonna just go through the analysis criteria for finding an application consistent with the land development code under your conditional use property. The proposed use for the subject conditional use in the IR district, the proposed design complies with the setbacks and other performance standards of the IR district. The proposed use will be located adjacent to other uses and will be built consistent with the performance standards for the IR district. The site is located north of a residentially developed properties on J. Rood Boulevard. However, the area is mix, has a mix of residential and manufacturing uses. The applicant, as you can see in the site plan, is also providing a buffer, an extensive buffer that's undisturbed, and they'll be doing additional plannings where it doesn't quite have 80% opacity um, to make that uh, additional buffer available so that there'll be a separation between the land uses. With that, the condition of use is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. The use will not result in any significant adverse impacts. The surrounding area is a mix of industrial uses and the adjacent properties are zoned to allow development, additional development of manufacturing industrial areas. You're in an area that also has some undeveloped manufacturing properties that are within the um, county, not within the city limits. So those are going to be developed at some point in time. Recognizing that the proposed use will not adversely affect the property values in the area and the development will not require the extension of additional public services the site is already currently served. Uh, the proposed use is consistent with the majority of the uses in the area as well as the planned uses in the area. The conditional use will provide for an efficient and orderly development and will put the site back into use that has been vacant for some time. Um, with that, I'm not gonna go through the entire criteria here. They're, other than to say here for the site plan, they're specifically meeting all of the, LD, the land development code standards that they have to meet for the site development piece. This is already an existing site, so they're retrofitting the site, adding the building and the additional pieces that they need to meet the uh, requirements of the land development code. It's consistent with the comprehensive plan. The level of service analysis is consistent with the existing level of service analysis for the building that's out there. That by adding this additional square footage, they're not increasing the need for services. The services that they're, we're, we're providing, we can already provide to them. So with that, um, we find that the, the um, application is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the zoning map. And staff is recommending um, Application 1745, Resolution 2017-21 uh, for, for a conditional use permit and a site plan route to allow manufacturing of recreational watercraft and construction of 7,980 square foot building at 1430 LNR Industrial in the RL in the RIR Industrial Restrictive Zoning District um, is approved with the following conditions. Developer is to, responsible for acquiring all jurisdictional permits and for meeting the minimum criteria of the land development code. Construction plan shall be consistent with the site plan and payment of all requisite fees attendant to the project shall be paid in accordance with the land development code. The existing structure will not be required to be retrofitted with sprinklers provided that the west wall of the proposed metal structure is a two hour rated wall separating the two buildings. The proposed metal building will be sprinkled, sprinkler protected. The fire department connection will be put out of the way from the building within 100 foot of the existing fire hydrant to the north side of the driveway. Uh, the existing gravel and grass pad in front of the proposed metal building will be either paved or rated to support 30 tons of fire apparatus. The applicant must provide shielded lighting and direct all lighting internal to the project and the conditional use and site plan will expire within one year of the approval if the building permit is not issued for the property. And with that, uh, the Planning and Zoning Board heard this on May 15th. Um, TRC also has reviewed this project and has approved it and the Planning Board unanimously approved the project. With that, I can answer any questions. Seeing none, does the applicant have any questions for staff before you get started? Any, okay, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is David Bell, 8515 Palm River Road, Tampa, Florida. Uh, we're here uh, just uh, request, respectfully requesting your approval on this. Ms. Urweller, I think, explained what we're trying to do, bring a manufa boat manufacturing company, 20 plus employees uh, to the city and uh, we're here to answer any questions you might have. Any questions from the commission? So is this boat manufacturing company in Tampa now? No, it's in, I think, Ozona. Okay. In Pinellas so County. It's you'd be state. moving this company to this property? Correct. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Please. The, uh, do you agree with the uh, conditions recommended by the staff? Yes, we okay, agree with those. And I want you we welcome you to Harper Springs, and I'm looking forward to the rebound check. Thank you. Good luck. Mr. 
Mr. Um, I don't have a question. I just want to say this location is the perfect location for your business. There's so many other boat, boating facilities out there. I know um, Gauze Built is out there as well. Um, so it's just the perfect area for uh, this type of business. So I want to welcome you to the community. Thank you. Commission Kicker is probably looking for a new boat. I just bought a new boat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dorado's a nice boat, though. <laughs> Yes. What? How many? Yeah. Do you know how many boats are going to be um, completed a month? We've been told uh, two or two or a few more than that a month. Okay. So it's it's custom built as they're ordered. Okay. Yeah, it's a funny intersection um, where this driveway comes out, and so I've got a concern because the, if you were to go left, um, there's a chance that someone would fly off Anclope Road and just blast through a trailer and a truck, and then it's also a dangerous intersection once you get out to ultra 19 um so i mean i would make a recommendation to anybody and within the company to take a right and go out to the light at ultra 19 and i believe it's anclo road or boulevard i get the two mixed up um anclo boulevard. anclo boulevard um because i know it's just a it's a funny situation right when you leave this property um and understand it's, it's an existing a, it's an existing driveway that um we're kind of landlocked. We can't adjust the driveway right. location either. Yeah, so. I see that. And I, and I um, thanks for, but uh, these are being taken off. I mean, are these sold like in a, a showroom somewhere or just they're personal ordered or do you know? I how think that works? mostly they're, it's custom, they're custom built on order. Um, they may have some in a showroom, um, but. Um, and there wasn't much parking it's out just, for boats in the parking lot. They don't. No, they're not going to store here. They're going to move them once they, they construct them. It's low volume. Okay. So I think that's the important part. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you uh, for the information. Other members of the public wishing to speak in opposition to the application? Members of the public wishing to speak in support? Would either party wish to make a closing statement of any kind? No. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Are there any other commission comments? Yeah. I, uh, I think this is a potentially gr another great asset for the city, like some other commissioners have expressed. Uh, to have another boat builder in the city of Tarpon Springs is huge, uh, and the jobs also for the city of Tarpon Springs. Uh, this is a great area for this to go to. Uh, there's another boat builder in the area, along with a lot of marine um, jobs in the area also. So uh, I'm happy to see this come before the board, and I think it's a great part or a great thing to see in Tarpon Springs. I agree with you, Commissioner. Uh, one of our objectives is to bring more business to Tarpa Springs, and thank you for coming. Roll call. Uh, motion, please. A motion motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes. So that concludes the agenda tonight. And we're going to the staff comments. Chief Coaching. No comments. Thank you, Mayor. Chief Attorney. No comments. City manager. Uh, just one thing, uh, a note on where we are with the negotiation of the hotel property. Uh, their attorney has asked us to, to give him the appraisal. He's going to, he wants to bring it to his own appraiser and evaluate before meeting. So they got it. He's in the process of doing that. And then hopefully we'll have our first meeting to start negotiations on that. Thank you. Madam city clerk. No comments. No. Commission kicked. Yes, we did already. Um, thank you. Yes, I just have one comment. Um, this Sunday at 11 o'clock, the Tarpon Springs Elks Lodge is having Flag Day, a Flag Day ceremony at 11 o'clock a.m. Um, and our um, Tarpon Springs Honor Guard will be uh, joining us. So, and we have a little um, ceremony that we do, uh, and then there'll be a cake and punch or something afterwards so if anybody it's open to the public anybody is welcome to come 11 o'clock at the Elks Lodge Sunday I'm looking forward to it yeah it would be fun yeah Commission Sieber yes we have a new event coming to the sponge docks uh, this weekend Friday Saturday and Sunday Opa Palooza so we're encouraging people to come out and enjoy three days of fun and music and, and food on the sponge docks so hope to see you out there Commissioner Carr? Uh, no additional comments. No comments. I got a couple of things that I'd like to uh, mention here that on s Saturday, June 17, the uh, Rose Cemetery has the uh, Centennial 
centennial celebration from 11 a.m. and that's located on Jasper Avenue. I'd also like to congratulate our Commissioner Suber for uh, graduating the Class 2017 Leadership for Panel. Oh, Congratulations. Thank you. thank you. Well, that concludes our regular session meeting and it's adjourned at 8.46 p.m. Second <laughs> first reading. I thought you were giving it to me. No, I'm not giving it to oh, you. You I keep it. it. You know what? Put you need to keep it. Can I don't know. I don't know. But uh, yeah. you did a great job explaining that, Mark. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Except I forgot. You look better in this uniform. You know, it's yeah. more comfortable. Huh? Pretty. Wait a second. Yeah, really no, thank you very much. Have a good day. You can say anything you want. Who's stopping you? No, I can't. My dad could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no worries. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't say you could. Just the key. Not in the office. So. No,